Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Doreen Edwards. I am the Dean of the Kazuo Mori School of Engineering, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to the 2016 Scholes Memorial Lecture. Dr. Scholes served Alfred, the Alfred University community for over 40 years after working in the glass industry for 19. He established the first glass science program in the United States, right here in the College of Ceramics at Alfred University in 1932. And he really put his mark on Alfred in establishing it as an academic institution who is interested and promotes glass. And the Scholes Library, and for his efforts, the Scholes Library and this lecture are named in his honor. Each year at the Scholes Lecture, uh, we recognize the Scholes Scholar. The Scholes Scholar is the first year student with the highest GPA. And this year, it is my pleasure to recognize Ms. Lindsay Periano. by her father Peter and I'm sure she's in her thoughts of her mother Susan who had to work today. Uh, Lindsay's majoring in biomaterials engineering and has earned a GPA of 3.98 during the fall semester. Wow. Um, I have had the pleasure of hearing Lindsay give a presentation as to why she chose the field of biomaterials. And I must tell you, I was absolutely blown away. And in fact, I was almost brought to tears. Uh, she chose her major with the clear goal of helping people with debilitating medical problems and changing the quality of their lives through biomaterials engineering. I know that we're going to continue to hear about Lindsay's accomplishments and her service to humanity in the years to come. And with that, I would like to welcome Lindsay to the stage to accept the Skolls Scholar Award. Stronger than steel. 
all this brittle can be rolled up like paper. And billions of minds spin the globe on thin strands of light. This is the glass age, where clarity creates a richer world. The frame brings us closer to family. The display expands the mind. And the lens carries us to the heavens. This is the glass age, when engineers cover our eyes with new ways to see. Architects build walls that open possibility. Artists use fire to capture the sun. And material scientists invent powerful solutions to impossible problems. Yes, this is the glass age. But it's only just begun. Its potential is barely tapped. Now we must look deeper, reach further, to see how glass's strength and beauty can show us the vastness of our own. The glass age is here. Come along, join us. So, if you're going to do all those things in glass, you better be thinking about the technical glass stage. Because it's all about glass and technology, and that's what we're going to talk about today. First, a little bit on corning. For those of you who are not familiar with us, we've been inventing since the 1800s. And yes, we really did make light bulbs for Thomas Edison. But more importantly, we invented ways to make light bulbs at 1,000 per minute, 2,000 per minute. And that led to the electrification of America and eventually the world. All these other inventions that you see up here are life-changing inventions made at Corning. The invention of silicone, the invention of chemical vapor deposition, the invention of glass ceramics, and the invention of tubes that could be used to make a radar display, which became a black and white TV, which became a color TV, which today has morphed into flat panel displays and TVs. And we'll talk more about that later. So Corning has invented and continues to invent a number of glass and ceramic technologies that have changed people's lives. What are we? We were founded in 1851, so we're 165 years old. We have about 35,000 people working for us at about $10 billion. And as it says, we are a world leader in specialty glass and ceramics. The businesses that we're in here are, left, are listed from left to right, on more or less in order of size, with display business still being the biggest business for Corning. Next is optical fiber, um, and you'll hear more about that. We're also in emissions control products, cellular ceramics, which make catalytic converters and diesel soot filters. We're in life sciences, and we're in a variety of specialty materials, which include pure silica and the famous gorilla glass. We also have a new division, which is carbon corning pharmaceutical technologies, which will change the way that, that uh, drugs are delivered to you. And a number of emerging technologies that are working, worked on in the group located in our laboratory. This is our laboratory, Salton Park. It represents about 80% of the people that we have in technology doing science. We're about 2,000 people in this facility, about 2 million square feet. Overall, this morning, we have another uh, 3,000 people that are engineers around the world. So a lot of technical people in the company to make this class age happen. So what do we do? We, we make materials, but we also invent processes. Because just having material doesn't work unless you have a way turn it into a useful product. And, and materials like glass can be particularly tricky as well as ceramics. So when you take a material like glass and we then invent a process like the fusion process, which allows us to make flat glass, extremely large, extremely flat. Or we invent a process like chemical vapor deposition, which allows us to make the first optical fiber. And we end up with the new products that Corning manufactures today. Specifically, we have a lot of materials processing capability in our laboratories. We have glass research, which can make thousands of different compositions. 
We have process reverse that can make continuous melting and fusion glass. We have extrusion capability to make cellular ceramic, new materials for cellular ceramics, the same quality as the factories. Uh, every process that we use in a factory situation is present at Sullivan Park or around the world in other laboratories. So that we can develop new processes and develop new materials that fit existing properties. We also do exploratory research. Um, we devote a significant part of our portfolio to early stage work. And we do it by using, one way we do it is by using grand challenges. We, the use of exploratory research in an industrial situation is, is tricky. You, if you just explore without even thinking about where you're going to go, chances are that less that we'll be able to somehow make use of and manufacture that technology someday. But if we stay within our grand challenge areas, we can extend ourselves into making glass even more unbreakable. We can think about climate change and what we could do with ceramics to be able to absorb CO2. We can make new optical fibers that can bend or go further than we ever went before and so on. We may be able to get communications at faster than the speed of light. And in fact, that's been demonstrated on pointing fiber uh, using the phenomenon of photons. So here's an example of a grand challenge. We make cellular ceramics. They have very high surface area. They've changed the world in terms of purity of the air more than any other product. So could we capture CO2 using a derivative of the cellular ceramic technology? We're working on that now. And it may happen. The big challenge to you as students is to invent materials, chemicals, that can capture CO2 and release it in a cycle which doesn't take so much energy that we didn't end up net behind. It's a great challenge. I think it's one of the most important challenges the world faces today. And I encourage you to think about it. Think about it as you do your studies. Another way of thinking of a grand challenge is taking the glass age ideas and trying to turn them into reality. So where does Corning participate in that? One way to think about it is that of all the bits generated by all the computers and phones in the world, about half of those bits travel on Corning fiber and cable. And about half of those bits are displayed on displays using corning glass. So we're always participating in the ways between computing and the actual physical user interface. Doing that in a variety of ways it can, it can mean new ways of rendering information, like OLEDs, and transparent and interactive displays. It can mean flexible roll-to-roll -roll manufacturing. And it can mean taking what we do on optical fiber and extending it into wireless applications, as I'll tell you. How important is wireless? Here you see projection of 30 billion wireless things on the internet in the relatively near future. Each one of those things only exists if it's getting bits from a computer, transmitting back, bits back. All those bits are going to go over uh, wireless for a little while and then over fiber and cable. So the expansion of the ability to transmit tremendous amount of information around the world continues to grow. Recent innovations from Corning in the glass area. Iris glass. This is the putting a piece of glass in the TV so that you can use it to distribute the light that's used to light up your TV. Currently that's done with plastic as TVs have gotten bigger and thinner. It's not working anymore. So a third piece of glass in big displays. Glasses that can stand very high temperatures, like OLED displays or a polysilicon vacuums. Willow glass, very thin, hot product. Or Gorilla glass, all coming out in new versions every, every day. Why do we think so much about glass in, in, in displays? Take a typical phone, you have cover glass, you can have an ITO touch panel made of glass, and you have two pieces of glass in the display itself. Uh, 
even if you're using them in an organic display. So all kinds of places where you're continuing to improve. Iris glass, as I mentioned, is using glass as a backlight for a TV. This is an actual first prototype of a iris TV. And you can see that at its thinnest, it's down to five millimeters in thickness. That thickness will go down even more as you go to thinner and thinner glass back lanes. Eventually, you'll end up with a TV of about two to three millimeters thick. All of this is built on the ability to make glass at that quality very, very pure and extremely flat. Pixel density is another way that that glass is being challenged as you go to displays which have higher and higher pixel numbers require fancier and fancier back main circuits, polysilicon or OLED displays. Those fancier circuits require you to be able to go to higher and higher temperatures. So think of making this piece of glass and being able to process it at six or 700 degrees centigrade and maintain the resolution that you started out with on that glass. You can't move more than a fraction of a micron in a, in a piece of glass two or three meters in size. So what are the trends in display? They've always been thinner and thinner. When we started in the flat panel display business, glass was about a millimeter to a millimeter and a half. Recently, main line at about 0.7 millimeters, but getting thinner and thinner. Now up to Gen 6, which is about two meters by two meters at three-tenths of a millimeter. Think about it. Going thinner, we're now down to, we're starting to get down in the manufacturing processes, 0.2, we have willow glass at 100 microns. 100 microns is the thickness of human hair. Glass is a different material than you're used to thinking about when you get down to 100 microns. Here's the process. This is the fusion process. Thanks to glass. Glass comes into the top of this isopipe, flows over on both sides, and recombines the bottom or the root. The reason the glass is perfect at that point because if you think about it, only the outside glass that has never touched anything is what's forming. The outside of the sheet, the two inside surfaces bond together and any defects are not the So that's the way fusion glass is made. And at 100 microns, you can now process it with rollers. So you're processing it the same way you would process plastic with paper. Here is a factory doing manufacturing of a willow roll of glass. That glass is about one meter wide, 300 meters long. <coughs> a very unusual piece of glass. What do you do with that kind of glass? Now, you've got to compare yourself to those other materials. You've got to compare yourself to paper. You have to compare yourself to plastic. You can't use paper for a lot of these of the things you want to do because it's not transparent, it's not high temperature. You move to polymers, you can do better. There's some transparency, but as soon as you want to do high temperature processing, or you want to do a process where the material substrate does not stretch or give in any direction, you can't do it. So for printing very high resolution, for printing, for doing patterning, for, for uh, doing gravure, type printing or plasma etching, any of these processes that you used to do on a single sheet of glass, you can do in a continuous process. Is this an engineering challenge? It is. It's a great challenge for you to think about. We've been working closely with the uh, Center for Advanced Manufacturing at uh, Binghamton. And we've been working closely with ITRI, which is the lab, national lab in Taiwan. These are some of the things that have been made. Touch sensors, color filters, TFPs, and actual full displays, flexible displays. And some of the neat things that are coming, printed antennas, OLED lighting, which is flexible. Nice term. Flexible lighting, in fact, if you want to look in the Corning website, you can see that we've just opened a 
challenge, an open innovation challenge, for designing lights using our new uh, OLED, uh, Willow-supported OLED lights, which are done in conjunction with the, the startup company uh, in the Rochester area. So we're offering a prize of uh, $10,000 for the best design of an OLED-based light. It's a completely different, the reason is it's a completely different way of thinking about lighting. You can now take this light, you can bend it in various directions, you can change the perimeter of the light to make it into some kind of shape. I'm not a designer, and I won't pretend to know what you might come up with, but it'd be a fun thing, and we're looking forward to what we see. Gorilla Glass has been a massively successful product made, so I think most of you glass people know, by ion exchanging glass. And coming up with much stronger glass than we started with. Right now, it's been used on over 5 billion devices, every major brand of phones in the world. The interesting thing for us as engineers and technologists is that we've continually improved the product. We started off with glass that was similar to what had been made and originally invented in the 1960s, according. We've now, we're now into our fourth generation, we're working on our fifth generation of glass. And we've added different attributes at each step, so that the glass has gotten thinner and thinner, your phone and tablet have gotten lighter and lighter to maintain the same amount of strength. Scratching is a big part of it. What you see here on the left is a competitive glass that's been scratched with a diamond at a set amount of force, and what you see all the flaking and fracturing that occurs when you use that amount of force on that glass. On the, on the right, you see Corning's damage resistant glass. The network of the glass is actually designed for plastic deformation. So you bring in a diamond, scratch us off the surface, you make a line, but you do not create fractures. No fractures present from the scratch, your probability of breaking becomes much, much lower. So those are the kinds of ways. We can, we've improved that. This shows some of the improvements in damage and how much that translates into what we call drop performance. How high can you drop your phone onto sandpaper or roadway and not have to break? So where does glass go from here? All kinds of places for technical glass and strong glass. We have this emerging innovations group that I mentioned briefly. The emerging group Innovations Group takes these products and extends them into new areas. And an exciting area, that, for example, is putting Gorilla Glass in cars. So we'll talk about that. We're looking at architectural glass, technical glass, being microbial glass, some new advanced flow reactors, a way of doing chemical reactions in glass in a more digital way than using a batch reactor, and all kinds of sensors that are coming along. Gorilla glass for cars. Why? It's lighter. You see uh, programs like Ford taking their biggest selling vehicle, the F-150 truck, and making it out of aluminum. Why would they make that big of a change? Because of weight. It took 600 pounds out of the vehicle. The glass that they use is the same. They're still at the same thickness. If you use Gorilla glass, well, one, of the one of the parts in the laminated windshield <coughs> As here on the right, you can take one of the sheets of glass down to 0.7, 0.5, maybe even 0.3 millimeters and get stronger at the same time. More ability to withstand shock. If smoother glass has displays um, projected onto the windshield, heads up displays between the four inches. All of this says technical glass is ready to go into automobiles and ready to save huge amounts of energy transporting around glass that was invented in the 1950s. The first car that has a Corning windshield and side glass and back glass is this supercar of Ford GT. Obviously, extremely small, small production numbers, but uh, a way of saying that this, this kind of product is going to happen. And in fact, uh, Corning just recently announced a joint venture with the Sanger Band their security commission which makes a significant amount of the world's glass for cars uh, to uh, commercialize grill glasses in broad automobile platforms. 
Architecture is another place. You can have electrochromic windows of various different types. This is this is one that we've developed uh, to support with uh, thin, uh, high-quality glass, uh, which uses a tungstate-based electrochromic in a company called View. Switching gears, optical communications, completely different science. <coughs> right now, optical fiber is extending itself, as you know, everywhere, right up to people's doorstep. Fiber to the home, for example. But also, more and more communications between data centers and you. And all of that takes continued advances in fiber, what it can what it can provide in terms of the ability to carry signals faster and, and better. So for one of those things, we have a fiber called Ultra. It's, it's a standout because it's loss. The amount of, amount of absorption of the light that happens is 0.146 decibels per kilometer. Remembering that that's a logarithmic scale. Uh, production glass started out in the dB per kilometer range. Ten years ago, it was in the 0.22 to 0.25 range. We're approaching the theoretical minimum the glass is of today. And that means a tremendous amount of information travel over the fiber. We're also launching a wireless platform. You say, well, why? What does that have to do with corning? Wireless is about transmission through the air. It is, but once you get off the air, you go on the fiber. So whether you're going to a cell tower, as happens today, or any place else where that signal is picked up, in a Wi-Fi system, for example, the data ends up on fiber. But we wanted to go further than that. And the way we're doing that with this one platform is to be able to put radio frequency signals over fiber optic cable. So you're taking the cellular RF signals, putting it on fiber, and trans retransmitting it within, within a building. It's referred to in the industry as a DAS, or distributed antenna system. So what that means is that you can dramatically improve quality of cellular coverage inside buildings. You can, you can use fiber to route your signal anywhere and get very high signal quality. And in fact, on the same fiber, you can have a 10G Ethernet at the same time. This is one of the first installations of Corning One Wireless. This is Texas A&M Stadium. There are 60,000 people there. At the same time, for every game, I guess they're always sold out. And most of the time, everybody there is watching YouTube, not the game. And they want to be able to get enough signal. But as you've probably experienced, been in New York City or any of the places where there are a lot of people in this stadium, although you can, you can see that you have coverage, there isn't enough capacity in the system, but things happen very slowly. In this situation, everybody has full coverage, so the signal goes to fiber, and the net result is that you have 60,000 very happy people, and the system is, is uh, expanding rapidly, going into to schools, industries, plants, more stadiums and uh, museums, a variety of different places. Certainly we have this, uh, as soon as it became a uh, prototype, we put it in Sullivan Park, and we've never looked back. So fiber will continue to contribute to a variety of new ways. Where is where's communications going to go next? There's no doubt that Corning is going to continue to participate in digital communication. But what's going to happen after fiber? One of the things we're, we're researching as a grand challenge is quantum communication. Quantum communication is a completely different way of sending a signal than anything that you do with today's processing. It's difficult, it's highly technical. But it actually has allowed some things that can't be done already, such as what's called quantum encryption of signals, so that you can provide true safe transmission of signals, undetectable. And this faster than the speed of light, where photons are launched in opposite directions in the same fiber, and yet photon A can communicate with photon B, meaning that it's communicating faster than the speed of light. 
What's this going to turn into? I don't know. Farm computers are going to come. Farm communication is going to come. And, and uh, that's part of the research that we're doing. I think it's exciting. Another area that glass is moving into uh, surprisingly quickly is substrates or uh, chips. In the area of high frequency chips, the ones that are being used as people plan for 5G, the next generation system with 4G uh, uh, wireless phones now that are going to 5G, the frequencies begin to become so high that you can't use plastic based substrate to put your chips on. And now we're starting to use glass. In and it's a great challenge because the challenge uh, that I received when this first came up from uh, Intel was can you give me a piece of glass with 10,000 holes per square inch? Think about it. I want 10,000 holes in that piece of glass per square inch, and I want you to do that on a big piece of glass so that I can make an entire chip, an entire substrate, a silicon substrate on it at the same time. It's very challenging, and, and uh, the product is starting to come out uh, right now. I think that. What you'll see is a continued pull for a variety of ceramic-based materials for chip substrates in the future as speeds go up and uh, applications can't deal with the, with the losses that are associated with being on homes. Uh, we've been in transportation for a long time. We celebrated uh, in 2012, the 40th year of cellular ceramics providing basis for catalytic converters, and uh, that business has grown to all over a billion dollars and is still growing, it's still growing in technology. This is what Los Angeles looked like in the early 1970s, and the next one showed what it looks like today. A huge change. Uh, thousands of lives have been saved, and the quality of life for millions of people have been changed by having the ability to have catalytic converters on cars. And that is enabled by ceramic technology. This is what it looks like today in other parts of the world. It still has not been, these, these technologies have not been mandated for the governments, or they're not enforced. And you see that kind of it can be avoided. But continued advances in what we can do with cellular ceramics have to happen. Diesel soot filters are now becoming gas. As, as uh, direct injection of gas is used in cars, particulates are produced. These particulates have to be filtered. So a whole new business based on a whole new type of, of material is starting to happen called gas particulates filters. So how does Corning see this overall? One of the reasons I'm here today talking to you is that we're a little worried about how much glass research is going on in the world in academic institutions. And with thousands of engineers, and thousands of scientists, we need participation by the great universities like yours in the, in the teaching of undergraduate and graduate level glass and ceramic science. So, why? Because as you can see, as we enter this glass age, this technical glass age, a tremendous number of uh, innovations, inventions, and scale ups are needed to be able to take these products to market. There's a lot of technology here. And as a, as a as an inveterate believer in the value of research, I have to say that there are inventions that are going to be made in glass that we, don't, we haven't even conceived of yet as long as we do the research. And we can only do research if there are students there to join us, to join the point. So we've been working nationally and internationally to, to revitalize the class research in the universities. One of the ways we've been doing that is to have a summit series. We had one two years ago, and we're having another one this June. And that brings together people from all around the United States in particular, but also from around the world and exposes them to all, of, all the things that we're working on, some of the things that I just talked about to you today. He says, why we need all this academic research and appointment of professors, we bring in the government so that we have to help uh, funding of uh, academic research. And all together, starting to change the, the frontiers by getting getting the schools back
back into doing less ceramic research. So it's very, very important to us. So, remember the grand challenge. Convert the, the vision of a day made of glass into reality. That's our challenge. I'm going to show what we showed at, at uh, the Consumer Electronics Show, uh, which is a huge show, if you've never heard of it, where all the technologies for, uh, for Consumer Electronics for the next year are introduced. And we put there this display. Thank you.